Thank you for joining us and welcome to another edition of Health in the Heartland, a program dedicated to the health issues that affect you. Joining me this episode, I have Dr. Martha Green and Dr. Andrea Watson. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as family physicians, I know you see a wide variety in your practice and actually it's pretty unique because you focus on the whole body and not necessarily a disease process or a specific targeting organ. What, um, Dr. Watson, do you see in your practice as far as your target population? Um, I see a lot of women in my practice, so for sure um, that would be my target population as far as uh, making sure that they are well uh, taken care of from a preventive standpoint and also from a um, chronic illness standpoint. Um, and again, as a family practitioner, Dr. Green, you're, you're seeing maybe the whole family too. Mm -hmm. So yes. tell us a little bit about the age, age group that you see. Well, we start seeing uh, children as young as five years of mm -hmm. age and, and we go to the oldest age that we possibly can. Um, and, and we enjoy seeing families. We enjoy seeing the mom, the dad, and the children, and even the grandparents too. I think that's one of the benefits of, of being a family practitioner is that you see all age groups. Absolutely, and I would think as family practitioners, when you see the whole family, they're able to, in a sense, do one stop. They're able to go in, and a lot of times families have a tendency to share <laughs> Uh, colds and flus and, and disease processes and maybe even um, this way you're able to get a little bit of family history as far as maybe risk factors. Could mm -hmm. you expand upon that for us? Very true. I, I think it's one of the benefits is that a lot of times you'll see mom and then mom will bring in the children and, and, and then the, the dad will come in later and by then you've met the whole family and, and you know the whole family history and I think it gives you a little bit more of an intimate relationship with your patients because not, you're not just confined to one person, it, it's the whole family. As family practitioners, it's important, I know, to partner with who you're taking care of. Dr. Watson, can you tell us some tips maybe for individuals that when they come to the doctor, how you can help partner together to find out really what's going on with that individual? What can they do to share with you so you might be able to find out? Um, one of the first things that um, definitely um, I find helpful in my practice is uh, building a trust with the patient. And um, that sometimes doesn't come with the first visit. Um, but just spending time um, actually listening to what they have to say because once a patient feels that you're listening and understanding and willing to help um, they're going to continue to come back to see you and once they see you more and more you can go through their issues um, go through um, just whatever um, they're experiencing even at home um, sometimes um, it, it goes deeper than just their chronic illnesses sometimes a lot of things can be social issues also I heard you use the term chronic and I know our viewers have probably heard the terms chronic and acute. Tell us a little bit about um, some differences maybe of an acute and a chronic illness that you might see in your practice. For an acute illness, I tend to think more of a, a sore throat, a cough, um, a fever, something that is going on for a short period of time. With chronic illnesses, I tend to think more of, of a longer duration. And good examples of that would be um, somebody with heart disease, someone with high blood pressure, or um, high cholesterol. So those are things that tend to be treated over multiple visits and, and something that you kind of carry with you over a longer period of time. And, and some of those with a chronic illness, you actually may have that for the rest of your life mm -hmm. or try to prevent it from getting to something uh, maybe even more serious, correct? Mm -hmm. True. And acute, you usually are able to take care <laughs> of it and hopefully get over it and feel better exactly. rather, co exactly. rather, co rather quickly. Now we've started a new year and most people like to think this year I'm going to be healthy and I, I want to start off and I'm going to eat right and I'm going to exercise. What are some tips, Dr. Watson, maybe for our viewers, general tips? I mean, how, how can we keep ourselves healthier? Well, first thing is um, seeing your primary provider. Um, I firmly believe in um, complete physical exams yearly um, for everyone, men, women, um, children. It's important um, because a lot of things that um, the patient can detect, the physician can, um, simply sometimes by examination um, and also some labs. So first thing is um, come see your primary pr provider um, so we can do an examination, um, uh, take a good history, um, and then assess from there. Um, and then we can also help you um, to come up with uh, um, resolutions as far as uh, wanting to sm uh, stop, smoking. stop smoking. Absolutely. 
and lose weight lose and some giving weight. some tips. Mm -hmm. And those are big ones. Of course, you know, obesity right now is um, a national epidemic, unfortunately. And so um, most most everyone can look at uh, revamping their diet and exercising just a little bit too. Exactly. So very good points. Now we're in a little bit of the winter months. So Dr. Green, what about washing our hands and some other tips that we might have for our viewers? Hand washing is very important. It's one of the easiest way that we can transmit viruses or even bacteria to each other. So I always recommend when you cough to cough into your elbow instead of your hands. But if you do, then carrying some hand sanitizer is always good. Or just you know before you eat to also wash your hands. Absolutely, and you know I think we now see a lot of those antiseptic bacterial exactly. antibacterial um, hand wipes and the hand washing gel and, and kids are even you know hopefully in their backpacks and different things too to make sure that we're doing that and what we touch we don't understand that we really bring it up to our mouth and exactly. our nose don't we an awful mm -hmm. lot so that's important what about a flu shot flu shots also very important recommend getting those every year um, and they're actually recommended for everybody um, people who should not avoid getting them are our elderly population, anybody with respiratory illnesses, and also our young children too, and especially pregnant ladies. Now we hear about a pneumonia shot. Tell us a little bit about a pneumonia shot. Pneumonia shot is recommended two doses before the age of 65, and once you turn 65, one dose is recommended. And I know we mentioned tobacco-free, right, Dr. Watson? Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Of course, don't start exactly. if you're, if, you know, you are peer pressure or enticed to do so. You have to stand up and write, say no. Right. What about those individuals that are looking to stop smoking? How can it benefit their health? Oh, um, tremendously. Um, starting with um, just healthier overall, um, just um, being able to um, breathe better. Breathe Absolutely. better. Absolutely. Um, and they catch colds. Do they not catch colds a lot quicker? They do. They do. Um, it can um, affect the immune system. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, they can get um, sicker than their average person. Um, also, their lungs aren't as healthy healthy as an um, average person who doesn't smoke. Um, so they're more likely probably to get pneumonia, okay, and other cold infections. What about, um, I know in your practice, and we've talked about um, seeing the whole family, secondhand smoke. What, what do you see with secondhand smoke in families? Um, particularly with children um, who come from secondhand um, smoking families, um, they tend, um, to um, carry what we call the acute uh, conditions such as acute otitis media, which is ear infections. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, a lot of asthma. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so those are higher rates for for children. I think, you know, right. it, we think of the adults smoking, we want them to stop, but actually it can affect the whole family exactly. um, if you're in the car and in the house. So secondhand smoke is a very big problem, I'm sure, I'm sure too. Now we hit, uh, I know earlier, a little bit about um, women's health. So tell us, um, what can our women do as far as preventative health and um, working with their family practitioner? Preventive health is, um, for a women's standpoint, is, um, is important um, and uh, shouldn't um, be, uh, women shouldn't miss the opportunity um, to receive preventive health, um, simply because insurance is um, also um, they see, you know, women have a tendency to actually be taking care of the family, mm -hmm. the kids, mm -hmm. you know, um, possibly, you know, the spouse or the partner um, involved. And sometimes they put their health, I know, on the back burner right, because right. they're taking care mm -hmm. of everyone else. What are some important screenings that we don't want to miss for women? Um, for instance, cervical screening. Um, since uh, cervical screening has been um, in action, um, we see a decrease in about 50% of cervical cancers. Um, women should have a pap smear uh, done um, on a timely basis. Um, age is a factor as far as uh, when screenings are performed. Um, according to the American College of OBGYN, uh, which is a society um, that um, gives recommendations as far as pre the, these preventative screenings, um, women 21 years of age and older um, should have a pap smear um, regardless of their first sexual activity. Mm -hmm. That's the baseline, um, just to get That's the baseline. Started. Okay. Um, women aged 21 um, to 29, every two years is recommended, according to the society. Um, at age 30, if they've had um, three consecutive, consecutive normal pap smears, um, then every three years um, for um, continual testing. Um, it will come an age where um, pap smears are 
likely not recommended. <laughs> For instance, age 65, 70, if you've had normal pap smears throughout, um, then um, it's actually recommended against pap smears. So, but it's very important during those childbearing years and exactly. then on into um, the menopause ward <laughs> yes. to make sure that you're getting screened on a regular basis. Yes. What about the importance of mammograms? Mammograms also, um, again, very important, um, needs to be done on a timely basis. Um, again, the American Cancer Society um, recommends that all women aged 40 and beyond receive a mammogram once a year. Mm -hmm. um, and it also depends on risk factors. If right. one has risk factors for family, um, risk factors for uh, breast cancer within their family, mm -hmm. um, of course, this needs to be done sooner. Um, and that goes back to the partnering that we were talking about, mm -hmm. making sure that when you're seeing your physician, make sure you really talk to them about um, your fam your personal history, but also your family history, and making exactly. sure that exactly. you're aware of your risk factors because each one of us are not treated necessarily the same way based upon also our lifestyle habits that we have too. Mm -hmm.